get into this. So uh, today the lecture is going to be fairly short, it'll be like 30 to 35 minutes or so. Uh, and then I'll have some extra time to answer questions after. Uh, we can, if we have uh, what most of you are going through right now, going through some homework questions, we can uh, talk about those. Uh, lecture question questions and questions about anything else. But I'll basically have a, a mini abbreviated office hour for the to fill up the rest of the time. Obviously stay until at least 4.50, uh, talking to you all, having questions, answering questions and stuff. Uh, but lecture itself won't last that long. So any questions before we get in? Talk about it. Let's talk about JSON. So JSON, uh, we will review a little bit, but here's the lecture question. Here's what we want to do is create this store class. I'm giving you the shell of the class. It has no real functionality, but I want a store that takes in its constructor and stores the state variables, how much hash is in the register as a double, and how much uh, what inventory it has is a list of strings. So no actual functionality. We don't have to build any functionality for this, but we, here's where we would uh, simulate a store and purchases and all that stuff. We're not going to worry about that for this lecture question, but what we do want is two methods to be able to convert this to JSON, to a JSON string, and populate the state variables from a JSON string. So as the as JSON method is going to return a string in a JSON format, uh, that's going to return the information of the store is a JSON string with as an object with keys mapping to the two state variables and values, those mapping to values based on the values of the state variables, the current uh, value stored in those. So whatever cache and register, whatever double that is storing, that's the value for that cache and register variable in the uh, key in the JSON string that's returned. <coughs> From JSON is accepting a string in that same format, accepting a string in that same format and populating the state variables. So whatever the state variables are when that method's called, we don't care about that anymore. We're going to overwrite those values with whatever values are in that JSON string that we're reading from that JSON, uh, from that JSON string from the input. Okay, so that's what we're trying to do. So let's get there. So a quick refresher on JSON. We talked about this in 115. Uh, JSON, uh, back up a little here. Uh, we have this problem that needs to be solved of how do we communicate across programs when we can have software written in many different languages, using many different libraries, many different frameworks and everything. How do we get these pieces of software to communicate with each other? And our first answer in 116 was, well, let's use CSV. It's a text format. Let's convert all of our information into text. Store it in a specific format, comma separated values, and then one line uh, for each row of values. And then we could save that as a file, or we could send that over the internet, and we can communicate with other programs because other software, no matter what language they're written in, they're going to be able to understand strings. Everybody can understand strings. So that's what we wanted. We got some nice functionality from CSV except we can only effectively store 2D arrays. We store matrices of values, and that's about it. We had to have very strict structure to those values, to the information that we stored in CSV. So we said, what if we want to store more complex information, communicate more complex information? That's where we brought in JSON. And JSON is a very elegant way of representing data with just the six type string number, which can be either int or floating point, Boolean, array, object, or null. With just these six values, we can represent a very wide array of different types and structures of information. We can represent just about anything with this format with just six types. And we worked with these in Python and JavaScript, and it was pretty easy, pretty straightforward in those two languages. We had just four methods total. In Python, we had the methods dump s. So we have uh, we have a Python type, a Python value, and we want to convert it to a JSON string. We call it dump s, s for string. Make this a JSON string, dump. If we have a JSON string and we want to convert it into Python types, we would say json.load. So if we have a JSON object and we want to convert that to a Python dictionary, json.loads load s, done. JavaScript, string find parts, same thing. If I have 
a JSON uh, JavaScript value. I'm going to call JSON.string find, turns it into a JSON string. JSON.parse takes that string, parses it into JavaScript values. So we did two languages in just one slide, straightforward, four methods, done. Now this works well because both Python and JavaScript allow us to have data structures with mixed types. So we can have a Python list that has ints, floats, strings, other lists, dictionaries. It can have all those as its values. So that lets us do this pretty easy because uh, JSON allows the same thing. We can mix the types in our data structures. <coughs> so these languages, not too bad, pretty easy. But what about Scala? What happens when we move into Scala and we want to work with the same thing? We want to work with JSON in this language specifically because uh, Scala is strongly typed. How do we handle this? How do we do this? So, so suppose we have a string, a JSON string in this format, and we want to uh, parse this thing. We want to parse this string into a Scala type. Now, in Python, we would parse this to a Python dictionary, and we're done. In JavaScript, we would parse this to a JavaScript object, and we're done. But what's that type in Scala that would map that would match this data, that would allow us to store this information in a data structure. So there's a few options. So first, we're looking at a JSON object. It's a key value pair. So let's look at our key value pair data structure in Scala and look at a map. OK, map, cool. What are the values going to be? Keys, well, JSON says every single key in a JSON object has to be a string. So problem solved, keys are going to be strings, no question, uh, no question for that one. So we have a map of strings to something, but what's the type of the values? JSON allows different types for the values in its objects, as does Python and J JavaScript, Scala does not. So we have a timestamp, which we have some integer value, which is too big for an int, so we'd have to use a long. So we could use a map of string to long. Great. But what about success as a string and this latitude and longitude as an object? How do we represent that? OK, maybe we try string and get success, but then we can't get the timestamp or the lat long. OK, if we want this lat long, we could do a map of string to string. And that'll get us there, but now we can't represent the other two data types. We have this issue where we can't represent these types in our map. We can't jam this into this one data structure, not easily anyway. There is one option we have, which is not a good option, is having a map of string to any. So of course, we're talking about polymorphism. Uh, we can leverage polymorphism and say, well, every single Scala type is of type any. It extends type any. So if we have a map of string to any, we can put literally anything in there. Any Scala objects can go in this map as the values. So now we can have our strings long, map of string, string, all of those fit the type any. The big issue here is that we're very restricted in what we can do. We can, we're only able to access the methods defined in the any class. And the any class only has a handful of methods. We can call to string on it. We can say uh, dot equals or equal equal to these equal each other. Uh, we can call hash code and a few other methods that are not particularly useful. So we can do a little bit of things, but we're very restricted in what we're able to do with that. We would like to have more functionality, but also be able to represent any type that can be in a JSON object. So we want to call in polymorphism in a better way than just using the any class. How do we do that? Well, what we'd like and what we'll have is one type that is extended by all of the six JSON types. And we're going to do this by pulling in a library. We're going to call the play JSON library in to help us here. And this library does exactly that. It has six types, one for each of the uh, JavaScript, uh, one for each of the JSON types, string number, boolean array, object null. And each one of these classes extends a JS value class. Now we have what we want. Now we're, we're looking good for a map of string 
to jazz value. And now instead of reading these as a long, a string, a map of string to string, we read these as a JS, uh, a JS number, a JS string, a JS object, and they're all of type JS value, and we store these in a map of string to JS value. Now we can leverage polymorphism to get the functionality that we need and be able to work with these six different types, even when we uh, are allowed to mix these types in our data structures. So our goal, what we need to do is work with these JS values in our programs, convert to and from JS value whenever we want to interact with JSON. So let's see a few examples, let's pull in this library, see a couple of examples of how to do this. So with this string, and this string by the way is from the ISS API, hey, telling us the exact location of the International Space Station, and in our code, we're going to assume that this string is exactly in this format. So the, the API documentation is going to have, uh, the API documentation has defined the structure of the information that it's going to send. So the documentation says, if you contact us, we're going to send you a JSON string. It's going to be a JSON object. It's going to have the keys, timestamp, message, and ISS position. The timestamp is going to be a JS number. The message is going to be a string. The ISS position is going to be an object with keys, latitude, and longitude. And the values of those will be strings, which I assume there's some interesting story about why these are strings. It seems like they should be doubles to me, but it's going to give us these values as two strings. So we, uh, so we have to parse these as strings. We have to respect the uh, the format that we're going to get. So we're going to write our code assuming this format is the format that we're going to get the string in, the JSON string, and then parse it accordingly. So how do we do this? We're going to pull in our library. This is something that doesn't come with Scala. It's like Scala tests. We have to pull, we have to pull this in through Maven, and I'll have a few slides at the end to talk about exactly how to do that. But let's figure out how to use this thing first. We're going to pull in our library and call the big json.parse method. This is our top level parsing method. It'll take a string, presumably in a JSON format, and parse it according to the JSON spec. So in this example, it's going to parse this string. This string does represent a JSON object, so it's going to return a JS object. But we don't know that that's going to return an object. I mean, we do for our specific application here, we're assuming, but this method doesn't only handle JS objects, so its return type is JS value. This is where we see the, the polymorphism coming in. JSON.parse returns a JS value. It could be any of the six types. For example, if I just had the, a string that had the number five, uh, that was the whole string, that's valid JSON. It's just a JS number represented as a, a, a JSON string. So that's valid, and that, that would return a JS number in this case, but it would return it as a JS value. So we're working with that base class. We're working with this abstract JS value class without necessarily knowing or caring, uh, I mean, we do as developers, but the library doesn't care if which one of the six object, uh, which of the six types it actually is in terms of Scala objects, it's just going to return a JS value which in this case happens to be a JS object. So the way the JS value class works is that it's going to allow us to treat this as a JS object and get the information out of it. The library has this syntax here of slash and then a string. That's going to say, as long as this actually is a JS object, so the JS object, the slash method will have this functionality and in the other five types, this slash actually in array, this uh, slash has the property uh, slash index as an int is going to give you the value of that index. Uh, the other four slash method is overwritten to do nothing. And since this is actually a JS object, we're going to say slash message, which is going to return a JS value that has the value of that key. So if 
parsed is an object, and if it has a key named message, it's going to give us the value at that key message as a JS value. Now this JS value in our particular application right here is actually a JS string, it's, and we can treat it as such. We can assume that's a string. We should have some tolerance if we're going out in, in production, having live users. But then we're going to have this JS string, and then we get to use this next method, this as method, which is very powerful. It's going to, uh, it's a method of the JS value class, and what it does is tries to convert this JS value into an object of the given type. And it's going to take a type parameter just like our data structures. We give it a type, and it's going to try to convert that, uh, that JS value to this type. Now in this case, the value at message was a string, so when we do as string, this is going to work fine because it actually is in fact a JS string, and we're able to do that conversion and return a string. Now we can store that value in a Scala string instead of a JS string. Now we can work with Scala as we know how to work with Scala. Same thing with timestamp. Too big for an int, so we'll use long here. We just do as long. That was, in fact, a JS number that we had. Parsed, give me the timestamp returns a JS value, but it was a JS number, and it was in the format of an integer value, no decimal place. So we're able to convert it to a long. The library is able to convert it to a long and give us that value uh, as a Scala long. Same thing with the ISS position. And here's where we get to see some of the power of the as method. Now we could get parsed of ISS position. This is a JS value. It is actually a JS object, but stored in a JS value. Uh, uh, we can start in a JS value variable. Uh, but it is an object, so we could do slash latitude slash longitude. We could get the values that way like we did with the original parsed. Uh, but we can also use this as method and just go right for the whole shot. We can say as map of string to string. And this as method, it'll recognize any of, uh, most of the base Scala types. So our, anything that goes on the stack. Uh, and also things like map and list are very common types in Scala. The as method is going to recognize those but it only recognizes types that it's specifically coded to recognize. The library has code for a string, long, map, and it knows exactly what to do with those types. But the as method does have limits. The library has to recognize the types, so we can't use as with any of our custom types. The library won't, won't recognize that unless we add that functionality to our classes. We'd have to add that, or, or to the library. Uh, but we'd have to add that functionality somewhere. So as, we can use this with Scala types, the basic Scala types, but not our own types. So for the lecture question, you can't just do as, uh, as store. It's not going to work for you. The library is not that sophisticated. All right, any questions on this example? OK, let's talk about writing JSON. So uh, let's assume we have the values that we want to put in this JSON string of this format as in the call of a method as the parameters. So we have the message, timestamp, and location. Location is in a location object. I didn't show on the slide here, but it's just an object I wrote that has two doubles for that long. None, uh, none sophisticated with that one. So assume we have all these values. How do we write a string in the same format? Well, we're, what we want is all of our information in a JS value, in some JS value. It might be any one of the six types, but it, it's got to be a type JS value or something that extends it, or something that extends JS value. Once we have a JS value, we can call this json.stringify method. The stringify is going to convert any JS value into a properly formatted JSON string. So that's our ultimate goal, is to get one JS value with all of our information, and then stringify it into a JSON string. So we're going to take each one of our values and convert them into JS values and get them in this format that we want. 
So our timestamp and message, we're going to use this method. We'll use this method a lot here. To JSON. To JSON is going to take a value and do its best to convert it to JSON. If it's one of the standard Scala types that the library knows about, then it's going to be able to convert it to a, a JS value of one of those six types. We don't know, we don't always know what type it's going to be, or, or rather we don't care. Uh, the library doesn't care, but it will do its best to convert it to one of those types. And we're just going to store it in a JS value. Uh, a JS value. It's going to return a JS value. So it is, in this case, for timestamp, it is a JS number. For message, it is a JS string. But we're just going to work with the base class so we can combine these into one data structure. We'll do the same thing with our locations. We'll create a map with the keys and values that we need, latitude, longitude, mapping to the lat and long as strings. These are doubles, so we've got to call two string on them. Get us this map of string to string and convert that into a JSON object. This library knows about maps, it knows about strings, and it, it's able to, excuse me, it's able to do this for us. So to JSON takes that map of string to strings, returns a JS object, but as a JS value, as that base class. But we have a JS object here. Now we have a JS number, a JS string, a JS object, but since they're all stored in variables of type JS value, we get to throw them all in the same data structure. So now we have one data structure, a map of strings to JS values, which represents our top level object in this JSON string that we're building. Throw all these JS values in there. And now just two JSON that. We have a map of string to JS values. The library knows about all those types. So it's able to convert this to a JS value with all of the information that we need. And then string by that, turn it into a JSON string. For the location map, why can't you do map from a string to a double? I could have. Um, so it doesn't have to be string to string? Yeah, right up here. I, I could have. Oh, no, this had to be string to string. You want this to be string to double? Yeah. This has to be string to string. This is uh, more of a, a nuanced point. But because the spec of the API decided to have these values be strings, I have to respect that spec. Okay. And send them a string. Integer, you'd be able to do it? What's that? Would you be able to do it with an integer? Yeah. Yeah, if these, yeah, we, we could, if we didn't have to have these as strings, if these were number values or we wanted those to be number values, yeah, well, everything's going to, everything's going to work the same way. We would just one, two string these and have this as map string to doubles. That's valid for the library. That's valid uh, for everything that we're doing. It just doesn't match the spec of the string we're trying to build is the only reason, which I assume I mentioned in this lecture. I didn't. The other two, I don't remember, they all blur together at this point. But uh, uh, these strings, I, I assume there's some interesting story behind this. But why are these strings? They should be doubles, in my opinion, at least. So I'm sure there's some good reason why this API was built with sh uh, strings instead of doubles for those values. But at this point, even if they want to change those to doubles, they can't change those, or at least they shouldn't change those. Because, uh, for example, our parsing code is hard-coded to match this exact spec, which expects those to be strings. And a lot of other people have code written that works with this API that expects those to be strings. So they can't just overnight say, you know what, those should be doubles, we're gonna change them to doubles, because that breaks a lot of code down the road. So once you publish an API like that, you have the documentation and everything, and people code to that doc. Uh, like we're doing right here, we're coding to that same spec. You can't really change it without breaking a lot of other people's stuff. So I imagine there's a story where some, some intern was in charge of making the format for this library, and they're like, oh, yeah, those should be strings. Oh. And then after it's published, it's too late. We can't change this back. They can't change this back to doubles. Either that or there actually is a good reason for those to be strings. Not familiar enough to, to make that call, but it just feels like those should be doubles. Any other questions? All right, so we, we pulled in a new library here. So how do we actually get that library? So we're going to use Maven again, and we're going to get Maven to install this for us. So this is, is our current Maven file that we needed for the lecture question so far. We only needed the Scala test library. 
And of course, I can follow the examples repo. But I kind of just recommend doing it. Take that pond.xml and use that wherever you, you need stuff. But if this was all we had, just this Scala test, how do we add another dependency to this? So for that, we're going to go to the site called the Maven repository. And this is a, a place that stores, that hosts uh, all kinds of libraries. Lots and lots and lots and lots of libraries. So let's check this site out. And take a look at what this is. So this is a repository, as the name implies, that is storing currently 16.4 million libraries that are out there for you to be able to take advantage of and use in your programs. So there's so much open source software out there these days, it's absolutely absurd. Pretty much anything you can think of, there's going to be something in this, in this repository that at least attempts to solve what you're thinking of. So I highly recommend when you're working on just side projects or just playing around, take a look through here, see what kind of libraries there are, try to think up some crazy thing, see if there's a library. Um, put that in your pond.xml, read some documentation and see how it works. You can get a lot of stuff done without having to recreate much code just by leveraging the open source software that's out there. So for our purposes, I mentioned something called the, the Play JSON library. Play JSON. Play JSO. Play JSON. There it is. And I get all kinds of information about this library. So I, what I, and if you're doing this, uh, what you need to pay attention to is the library is going to be compiled for a specific version of Scala. So we have to, for this class, pick a 2.12. We're going to take the latest version of the library and get the 2.12 version of Scala. This is why we're using 2.12 is to make sure we have compatibility with all the libraries we're using in the class. So 2.12, it's going to take me to this page. And there's my dependency. I paste that in my POM file. It knows what I'm doing, so I don't even have to control C. I just click it and it copied it to my clipboard for me. Because it knows what I'm doing. It knows that I'm grabbing. I want to grab this. I want to paste that in my POM. And I want Maven to install this new library for me. So if we paste this in our POM, rerun Maven. Or usually a, a notification comes up and says, hey, we detected your prompt change. Um, you want us to download that new dependency for you right now? And you click, yeah, do it. And then it does it for you. It uh, downloads, links that library. And then you can import those classes and start using this code using this library. There's all kinds of stuff in here. Anybody have something they want to search for? See if it exists. See if somebody shared something. Oh man, we we didn't quite uh Yeah, let's say we we actually found one that doesn't quite exist. Oh man. That can't be. Yeah, but yeah, but I expect at least to have some some add-ons, extensions, plugins, some some for it. Yeah, you're not gonna have the whole Unreal Engine because it's not written in Java. But there should. You, you did say it, plugin, though, right? Yeah. Uh, yeah, I expect that it'd be some plugins or something, something to go along with the Unreal Engine. No, that's kind of disappointing. Man, but we do have other stuff, I guess. Apache Velocity Engine. Just look up Game Engine. Oh man, I'm sad about that. Here's something. 
There's a 3D game engine for adventurous Java developers. Not just Java developers, but adventurous one. Uh, so maybe the search feature just isn't the best. I'll, I'll blame the search feature. Uh, I mean, that's made to search by the name of it, not the description of it. So I guess we'll come some site there. But hey, at least we got a game engine. And I'm sure there's more of the Play JSON library that we're using. The Play library itself is a game engine, uh, game engine software too. So there are multiple game engines on here that work for, for Scala. Uh, everything on here is compiled. So it's compiled into Java bytecode. So it's working in Java or Scala or any other language that works, uh, that compiles to Java bytecode. So yes, it says Java developers, but it's Java compiled into Java bytecode, completely compatible with Scala. And we get the top level play These not have like I would like a link right to the play website from here. Oops, oops, oops. I don't want to click an ad. Was I You know, I had a doubt in my mind when I said it, and uh, and it was right. Play is not quite a uh, game engine. For some reason, I was thinking it was a game engine. It sounded wrong when it came out of my mouth, so I wanted to double check. So it's not a game engine. It's a uh, a framework for uh, for websites, a web framework. That sounds more like it. Uh, I don't know what I'm thinking of, but there there's a Java game engine that we use for something that I use just one piece of the library like we're doing with the play JSON we're just using one piece of this overall framework just the JSON parsing